You ready, Michelle? We're ready. On behalf of the Murray Calloway County Chamber Board, my name is Jeanette DeWitt. I am your chair this year, and we are so happy to have you for our very first virtual plugged in. We have our sponsors on here this morning, which is AT&T. Thank you both so much. Hood and Hunt, we're so grateful that you're here with us and are doing this plugged in virtual series with us. Welcome attendees and Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for being our first presenter and going over everything. Uh, we are still navigating through 2020 and doing things a little bit different. We understand that virtual is becoming a new thing that is kind of the more common ground, uh, but we wanna do things that are important to the community, important to our business leaders. And so for all the participants that we have this morning, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to this plugged in series. At this point in time, I'm gonna turn everything over to our president and CEO, Michelle Bundry. Thank you, Jeanette, and it's good to see you. Um, a month into uh, being announced as board chair. So I appreciate um, your leadership and look forward to working with you this year. Um, if you want to get to know Jeanette a little bit better, recently on Facebook, we launched a chatting with our chairs. Since we didn't get to do our annual business celebration where we officially passed the gavel, um, we just had a sit down with our outgoing board chair and Jeanette to talk about what happened this past year and to look forward into the future for our organization. So be sure to go to Facebook and click on that video um, just to get to know them a little bit better and hear how we pass the gavel in creative ways, which is what we're all trying to do right now. But I just wanted to share really quickly some things going on at the chamber. Um, it's been a while since we've seen people in person. Typically we would have many in-person events Get to shake hands and get to see people and hear what's going on um, but it's all been technology which we'll talk about with our sponsor today which we're very appreciative for especially during these times uh, but this fall we're always excited about fall because it means the holidays are coming which means people are eating and shopping local um, holiday open house will be november 13th through the 15th which is always a great time people come from all over to shop our wonderful uh, boutiques get coffee at our local coffee shops or eat at our restaurant. So um, that make sure to mark those calendar dates um, in your planner or on your phone. <laughs> um, and we're gonna do some really fun go local initiatives this fall. Um, you know, we always wanna promote shopping, eating, playing local. Um, and more than ever, our small businesses need your support. They are what make our community unique. So we really wanna see them succeed. Um, and then we just launched a new program. Um, if you look on our Facebook page or have seen your emails, TVA um, has partnered with the Chamber and our local Economic Development Corporation to launch their Remote Work Ready uh, pilot program. We are one of seven communities that they chose to launch this program, and we're really excited to be a part. You can go to our website, www.mymurray.com, under the job section. Um, to see job postings, but also remote job opportunities. And we're really excited to diversify our local economy with different job opportunities, but we want to keep people local um, so that they can shop and support our local businesses, their children can be in our schools, and they just help make our community very vibrant. Um, so we're happy to have this partnership. We're really excited to see where it goes. Um, I think about Dr. Jackson, if you're recruiting a new faculty member, the trailing spouse could be a great opportunity for them to connect to the remote work opportunity. So um, those are just some things that we're looking at. I'm really excited that TVA chose us um, out of several states as a community, and we're looking forward to where that program is going. We know we can't have in-person events, so um, virtual is the way that we are going. And we are so excited to do a four-part virtual series, and today Dr. Jackson's kicking that off with us. But this series would not be possible without our sponsor, which is AT&T Kentucky. We've got both Hood Harris and Hank Manjo here with us this morning. Um, and I think Hood's gonna share with us a little bit about AT&T, but before I get started, I want um, to read a little bit about Hood because um, he has a very impressive bio here. Um, Hood Harris has served as the president of AT&T Kentucky since August of 2013. As president, he is responsible for the company's local, state, and federal government relations, public policy, and community relations initiatives across the Commonwealth. 
Hood served as Deputy Regional Vice President for Public Affairs before becoming president. So he's been with AT&T for a while. He's also responsible for managing AT&T's extensive philanthropic and community engagement efforts in Kentucky, including the AT&T Aspire program focused on high school success and workforce readiness, and the AT&T It Can Wait campaign to end texting while driving. As a parent, not of teenagers yet, I appreciate those efforts <laughs> for when my teenager or kids are teenagers down the road. In addition to his work with AT&T, Hood also serves as board member for several community organizations, including the boards of the Louisville Urban League, Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, Greater Louisville Incorporated, and the Louisville Area Chapter of the Red Cross. He has more than 20 years of government affairs experience and is a veteran of national, state, and local, local political campaigns. Prior to joining AT&T, he served as the Chief of Staff to Alabama Congressman Robert Adderholt in Washington, D.C. His interest in communication technology was sparked at Auburn University, where he studied engineering. He and his wife, Heather, have one son, and they live in Louisville. So thank you for joining us this morning from Louisville all the way to connect with us here in Callaway County. And without any more, I'm going to turn it over to you to share with us this morning. Great. Thank you, Michelle. It's, it's great to be here uh, with you today. And, I, and we're thrilled to be a sponsor of this series. And one thing you said earlier is, is we are finding new ways to do things, but make them impactful for our community and for the business community. And I can't think of a better way to start than with Dr. Jackson and Murray State and the impact that that institution has, both in that area and in the state and across the region. So uh, I, we're, we're, it's a great, it's a win-win situation. We're glad to be here. Um, I do want to mention one thing, a little commercial plug, um, is we're rolling out what we call our first net network. And that is after 9-11 after in 2001, we discovered that first responders couldn't communicate across different communication systems. The federal government wanted to set up a nationwide first responder network. AT&T bid on it. We won it. Um, and that is dedicated bandwidth for first responders. That is priority and preemption. Um, back in the pre-pandemic days, if you had a whole stadium full of football fans, you might have a hard time getting a phone call out, but if you're a first responder on FirstNet, your device will be able to communicate. You get priority and preemption on the network. And the interesting thing about it is it's not just for firemen and policemen, it's also for EMTs, doctors, nurses, even school districts and local utilities can qualify for this service. So if anyone is interested in that, it's att.com slash FirstNet for more information or contact Hank and I. So with that short commercial plug, let me get to the um, what we're all here for, and that is for you to introduce Dr. Jackson and hear about what's going on uh, with his institution on campus. We appreciate their partner of ours. We have, as we we're speaking about earlier, we have antennas on some of their taller structures to serve the community with our cellular service. Um, just part of our $800 million we've invested in Kentucky in the last three years. So without further ado, Michelle, I will turn it back to you and let's hear from Dr. Jackson. All right, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And more than ever, technology and communication is important. We've seen that through having to go virtual, not only with the schools, but with business. And it hasn't been easy at times. So we really appreciate um, your partnership and investment in Callaway County. We look forward to working with you further as well. I know everyone's ready to hear from Dr. Jackson. We had a few questions submitted and he has been passed those questions. So we'll see if we get to those today. No pressure if not. <laughs> but um, our first speaker in our series this morning is Dr. Jackson. And we are so excited that he's here. Um, and so I'm gonna just read a little bit about him and then I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you to speak this morning to us. Dr. Jackson was named as the 14th president of Murray State University, go racers by the Board of Regents on March 1st, 2019. Previously, Dr. Jackson had served as interim president since August of 2018. Prior to assuming the presidency, Dr. Jackson served as president of the Murray State University Foundation. He also served as associate vice president for institutional advancement and was the university's chief development officer and was responsible for state and federal government relations. In addition, he served as the director for the university's $70 million comprehensive fundraising campaign, Hold That Banner High, which is the campaign for the students of Murray State. 
Dr. Jackson was initially hired by Murray State in 20, or 2005 as the Director of Gift Planning. From 97 to 04, he served the Commonwealth of Kentucky as a state senator, served in Senate leadership as the minority whip and held other appointed roles in government. In addition, Dr. Jackson has extensive experience as a corporate executive and in investment, banking, and financial advisory fields. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Finance from Murray State, a Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration from Antioch University, and a Doctor of Education degree in Educational Leadership with an emphasis in Higher Education Leadership from Western Kentucky University. He also holds a Certificate in Fundraising Management from the School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. In 2010, he completed the Council for Advancement and Support of Education Summer Fundraising Institute at Dartmouth College. So thank you so much for joining us. I think even Karen's on here this morning, so we appreciate your family being a part of this as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna share our screen and then I'm gonna let you go into your presentation. Michelle, thank you and thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it very much. And Jeanette, thank you. And, um, and very, very importantly, thanks to AT&T wonderful partners to Murray State and wonderful partners to the Chamber. And we appreciate all that you do for uh, this, this community, the state and, and, and beyond. So uh, it's, it's good to uh, see you all this morning. So I can't see anyone else, but I know there's a lot of people out there. The most important person is my wife, Karen. So she's here and I'm not sure if she can unmute and take questions. So you can ask me any of the softballs and I'll take them and any hard questions we'll say for Karen at the end. Um, and she can, she can answer them uh, quite well, but I'm glad she is on here uh, also. This is an abnormal, uh, unprecedented, unimaginable time. We all know that. And uh, I wish we were in person this morning. And last year when we gave a really a state of the university address, we were together in the Murray Room. We had a wonderful breakfast and uh, we all prefer that. This will pass. Uh, it, it will pass. Uh, I'm told most days we'll be better for it and stronger for it and be better prepared for it. Some days I question that, uh, but I know that deep down that, that is true. Uh, so for all of us, uh, you know, we're trying to navigate some very difficult waters. So I'm thinking about uh, you all as well. Also, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, our alumni and friends and sponsors and supporters, whatever, whatever uh, you do for Murray State University. Uh, we appreciate it very much. You're vital to our mission. You're vital to day-to-day uh, -day operations uh, at this fine institution, especially now. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, uh, that's out there this morning. Lastly, uh, before I start, um, I'm going to walk through some new news. I'm going to walk through... Um, uh, several items and we'll take some questions that I've already had some submitted this morning. We'll take those at the end and 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 if there's other questions, you can probably chat them in to uh, Michelle and she could she could uh, let me know if we have time uh, at the very end in regard to, to those questions as well. So Michelle, if you would go to the next slide. So I know everyone can see uh, this presentation. So I'm going to touch on the racer restart plan and what that is and what it means as we uh, navigate this global pandemic at Murray State University. This is week four uh, of classes. So, uh, you know, we, we've made it and our, our goal is to uh, get to uh, November 20th, our last day of classes. I'm confident we will. And we've made a lot of plans for many months in regard to that. And I'll touch on that in just a moment. Campus enhancements, this is ranking season. So we, there's a lot of national, international publications that tell us how we're doing and, and uh, all of that. I wanna to touch on a couple that I'm very proud of. I, I wanna talk about the economic importance of this institution uh, to this community, to this region, and to this commonwealth. Uh, something that's very important uh, the last uh, few years, so I've been in this job in either an interim uh, in an interim role or a permanent role since August the 7th of 2018. It's hard to believe, so I've started a third year in this role. Um, 
someone was telling me yesterday that the last year has been like dog years. So I feel like I've been in this, uh, in this job for maybe 20 years now. It, it's, uh, it's been a tough uh, for all of us. It's been a tough uh, last several months. So I'm going to touch on enrollment. And, and so you know the students that are now in this community studying at Murray State. And then I'm going to ask you for some, some help. Uh, and we'll take some questions at the end. So. so our racer restart plan. So this pandemic really dates to February. We, we actually formed a task force in February to start planning on how to respond and, and how we would turn campus down, if you will, and, and, uh, and start making changes at Murray State back in February. We made those changes in March. Uh, we went totally uh, remote or online at that point in time. And almost immediately thereafter, we started planning for uh, what's this going to look like when we emerge on the other side of this global pandemic. And we've called it a racer restart plan. So about 200 faculty and staff and students and administrators and healthcare professionals have been uh, extremely involved uh, for the last many months in regard to this plan to safely uh, open this campus back up, focusing on the safety and health and well-being of our campus community and our broader community. Uh, it's vitally important to us, and, and I want to thank all of those individuals who have spent a lot of time in regard to uh, the work on this particular plan. Some, some important notes, and I'm asked this nearly every day, so I'm going to say it again. And I know uh, I talk to student groups every day. Last night I talked to a student group. I've got Tonight, I'll be talking to advisors to student groups. So every day and night, uh, Dr. Robertson, myself, and others at Murray State are talking to students and student groups and, and uh, advisors to groups. We're talking to faculty and staff in regard to really our racer safe and healthy guidelines, what those mean and why we should be doing these things. And, and probably first and foremost, and it's required at Murray State, whether you're on campus, in the classroom, uh, whether you're uh, after hours uh, as, as well. I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes. Masks are required. And, and we put this in place uh, long before um, you know, the state put the mandate in place. So there's a state mandate even on top of this. But masks are required. Most healthcare professionals uh, that, that you will hear from and, and, and talk to say that 75% of this pandemic, uh, this virus can be controlled by simply wearing a mask. It's not a lot to ask. Uh, it's cheap and easy. And if that's what gets us through this, masks are required. And uh, we, uh, we talk about it daily. Social distancing, obviously, is important. Something that we talk about regularly, and it's very simple also, make good choices. Just make good choices. And you know, avoid large crowds. Um, wear those masks. Make, make sure that uh, you're, you're doing all the other things that, that our parents taught us of you know, washing our hands and doing those simple things. That's how we're going to control this and that's how we're going to get through uh, this particular semester. And I could go on and on in regard to these particular items. I, I won't, but if you want to review videos that we, we have made in the last several months, uh, Q&A, uh, any information that we send out regularly to students and faculty and staff on this campus, you can go to murraystate.edu slash racer restart. And you can look at how many cases uh, are on this campus, how many active COVID cases are on this campus. Uh, and we update that uh, every Monday. So you'll, you'll see any of that information and, and more uh, uh, as we protect uh, this campus community and, and beyond. Okay, Michelle, and we'll go to the next one. So it's ranking season. So here's some some good news. It seems like 90% of what we talk about, or 95% on some days, what we talk about is in regard to COVID-19 and global pandemics. Also, other important publications are looking at Murray State and give us information in regard to how we're doing. And obviously, we're proud of uh, being recognized by U.S. News and World Report as one of the top public universities in, in the southern, really southern quarter of this country 
Forbes uh, for the last many years and said we're one of America's best colleges just a few days ago. Washington Monthly Magazine said, again, we're one of the best banks for the buck uh, in this country. We're the top public best bang for the buck in Kentucky, measuring academic quality with the value that you receive, the cost of attendance. So we, uh, we hold the top position uh, in Kentucky in that regard. Money Magazine, uh, probably everyone's familiar with that magazine as well. So uh, they started uh, ranking institutions once again uh, this year. We're the top public in Kentucky when you measure, again, the same thing, quality and the value. And so uh, we're, we're very proud of, of those items, especially in this day and age, and especially at this particular time in our history. So at our last board meeting, and we've been working on this for about a year, we made the recommendation and, and it was unanimously approved. Uh, our former Institute of Engineering is now a School of Engineering. And, and why is that important? As we continue to grow and expand and add new programs in engineering and engineering technology and related fields uh, like cybersecurity that uh, uh, is important to at and and they've been very helpful in regard to the School of Engineering in the past, this will allow us to uh, promote and advance this particular area of the institution uh, uh, better and, and more quickly. And so the School of Engineering, uh, we all know that's the, the, what we've called the Engineering Physics Building, the Institute of Engineering Building on, on 16th Street, right across from Wells uh, Hall. Uh, it's the newest building on our campus. And this particular building is a state-of-the-art, wonderful facility, could be on any university campus in this country. And so we're really proud of the growth here. Uh, the, the, the number of students entering these particular programs in engineering, engineering technology, and other related programs uh, is growing and has been. And uh, uh, the chair over this area is Dr. Danny Claber. Uh, it is a part of the Jesse D. Jones College of Science, Engineering, and Technology. Uh, and, and Dean Claire Fuller is the dean over this particular college and over the School of Engineering as well. So we're very proud of that, and you'll hear more in the days ahead in regard to growth and activity out of our uh, School of Engineering. So if you've been on campus, uh, you'll, you'll notice still there's a lot going on. Now, when this pandemic hit and we were in, in the middle of it, uh, we had to make a lot of decisions and slow certain things down from a budgetary standpoint, but campus looks great and there's still a lot of things going on on campus that we're moving forward with that we needed to move forward with in regard to deferred maintenance and asset preservation as the state calls it and, and really focusing on some areas of the institution that haven't been focused on uh, from an enhancement standpoint in some time. I'm going to touch on it in just a second, John W. Carr Hall. That used to be, uh, when I was a student here, and when many of you were students here, that was called the Carr Health Building. So we, we changed uh, John W. Carr Hall to, uh, or Carr Health to John W. Carr Hall, and his name is now on that building. So for uh, 75 years, his name has not been on that building, and he's the first president, uh, Dr. Carr was the first president of this institution. This is a way to recognize him uh, who helped build this campus with our founder, uh, Dr. Rainey T. Wells. And uh, you'll see some renderings in just a moment in regard to that. Many of you probably have noticed the Price Doyle Fine Arts Building, um, a lot of activity there. Uh, several months ago, we started power washing and painting that particular building. Uh, it hasn't been done in many, many years and it looks much better, but that's a uh, a focal point is the tallest building on this campus, but it's a focal point of this campus as well. So it just didn't look uh, like it should. And now I think we're making some great improvements uh, to, to the look and design and feel of our campus community. In the Kerr Center, a lot of uh, changes have occurred there for the benefit of our students and, and faculty and staff and the broader community. Uh, Chick-fil-A obviously has been open for some time. I talked about that last fall at this update at the Chamber Breakfast. Uh, Starbucks uh, literally opened a few weeks ago uh, when the semester opened. Einstein's Brothers Bagels is in Waterfield Library. So, you know, we're improving uh, eating options and opportunities for our students 
you know, and faculty and staff, and even the broader community across campus. Uh, Steak and Shake, uh, Tres Habanero, Subconnection uh, are all open what, as well in the former tea room. Uh, so you'll see a lot of new activity there, and they literally opened just uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to show you some renderings of uh, a Racer One statue. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit as well. Uh, I think you'll be very pleased to see that. For many, many years, we've been talking about uh, a monument, a bronze statue of Racer One on this campus. And uh, uh, so we're able to do that now. And, and you'll see uh, Racer One standing proudly uh, in front of the Kerr Center in, in the weeks to come. So Lovett Auditorium, our other historic buildings, a lot going on there in regard to improvements and taking care of the assets we're entrusted with. And uh, these are very old buildings, some dating back to the very beginning of this university, 100 years uh, uh, nearly. And, and so we must take good care of these particular assets. Woods Park, a lot has been going on there. So the corner of uh, really almost 15th and all of that corner, you'll see, uh, where Woods Hall used to be is now Woods Park, named after uh, Dr. Ralph Woods. And there's a lot of other uh, housing improvements and other things in, in the works that will be going on in the, in the months ahead, post pandemic. So here's some just quick pictures of uh, Christ Oil Fine Arts Building. Uh, work's been going on there for a few, uh, several weeks, a few months. And uh, you'll see, uh, I wanted to point out in the top right, you know, we've got banners all over this campus. We've got yard signs all over this campus. It looks like uh, there's a political campaign coming, but face masks are required. And, uh, you know, we continue to uh, point that out uh, daily by, with social media, with email, with text messages, with signage on campus, speaking to our students. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, at, the, at the end of this presentation. So. Um, this, th these are some activities going on on campus. This is John W. Carr Hall. So this is what it'll look like very soon um, in the mall area. We're, we're just improving that. John W. Carr Hall is on the name. Is, it, the name is now on the building. If you walk by there today, you'll see that. Uh, to the right is a bronze statue of Dr. John Carr, who will sit on a bench in front of John W. Carr Hall. So you'll be able to stop and get a picture taken. Uh, you'll, you'll be able, I know it'll be a hot spot for alumni and friends as they visit the community in the months to come, uh, whether it's at homecoming or family weekends, uh, and even for our students. So uh, uh, this is just a nice addition and, and a tribute to Dr. Carr and his contributions to this institution. I could, I could give you uh, uh, an hour lecture, and I, I will not in regard, and I mean a lecture from an academic standpoint in regard to Dr. Carr and his significance to uh, this institution uh, in partnership with Dr. Randy T. Wells and in envisioning this institution and building this institution. Also, it's important, I want to note this, and, and I don't know if Dr. Jack Rose and Janice uh, Rose are on, on uh, this meeting or in this meeting this morning or not, but I want to thank them. They made a very generous donation uh, to fund Dr. Carr to sit in front of John W. Carr Hall. And uh, I want to personally thank them and publicly thank them uh, for their support uh, of this bronze statue uh, and, and uh, an extremely generous gift and, and will have a long legacy and there'll be a monument on the, in the ground uh, really telling, telling the community about Dr. Carr. Um, you know, in the years to come, many, maybe many years to come, you know, we may forget about who John Carr uh, was. Uh, and now I think there will be a permanent marker and we'll be able to have a daily reminder of the significance he played in this institution uh, in the 20s, 1920s. Okay, so this is in front of the Curris Center. This is being constructed. If you go by there on Chestnut right now, you'll see uh, this being constructed. So the, the monument on the left side, the architectural rendering doesn't do it justice. Racer One is going to be 150% of life size. And on the right is the actual bronze statue in secure storage along with Dr. Carr. Uh, and the, actually Racer One will have a jockey, you'll see in just a second. 
so this will be a nice addition to this, uh, to this campus and to this community. The Curris Center, uh, arguably, outside of our academic buildings, is the most important uh, building on this campus. That's where our students congregate. That's where new students come for campus tours. That's where new families come for campus tours. That's where our alumni and friends come for, uh, go to the bookstore for racer gear. So a lot of traffic uh, in and out. Uh, and a few people may be going to Chick-fil-A or Steak and Shake as well, but uh, this is a very important building and I think a, a very important enhancement addition to this campus that I think uh, will be extremely nice in the next several weeks as we, uh, we have a dedication to Racer One. I also, I want to point out again, Dr. Rose and, and, uh, and, and Janice, um, you know, the former mayor and Mrs. Mayor uh, also made the lead gift for Racer One. That was part of their overall gift. So they funded um, this bronze statue. And then we had several other donors make major gifts to fund the base and all the other activities. In this environment, we had to rely on our alumni and friends and private donors to do these things. Um, we started working on them over a year ago. And uh, so now they're coming to fruition. And, and I think, again, there will be wonderful enhancements to this campus. And I think everyone uh, on this call or in this meeting and beyond will be extremely pleased with how we're enhancing our campus community. This is uh, uh, Racer One's jockey. And uh, so she will be sitting uh, on top of uh, Racer One and again, this particular uh, bronze statue is about 150% of, of life size. So it'll be a great photo spot, a great visitor spot, a great spot for uh, new students and alumni and friends, anyone visiting this community. And I envision uh, a lot of photos being taken and a lot of social media activity uh, in this particular area. Murray State University all, already has the distinction of being the most Instagrammed campus, private, or public in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. This is, again, it's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful university. It has been for many, many, many years. And, uh, but we, uh, Instagram tells us we're the, the most Instagram campus in the Commonwealth. So I want to touch on, <clears throat> excuse me, the economic importance of Murray State University to the region, the state, this community. Uh, Dr. Gil Mathis in 2016, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a message came in to me, I paused. Dr. Gil Mathis um, uh, did an economic impact study in 2016 in regard to the impact of Murray State University, uh, again, on the community, the region, and, and the state. And some important points. Now, these have changed slightly. Uh, but, but really their own point. I talked to Dr. Mathis uh, some time ago in regard to it. He said, you know, these are still really on point numbers, but it, at least I think they're instructive to, uh, to where we are today. You know, we're the, we're the largest employer in, in far Western Kentucky. There's about 70,000 alumni, about 35,000 of them are in Kentucky. Um, 6,025 jobs are created direct and indirect uh, about 1250 jobs are direct there's about 18.2 million dollars of annual state and local tax revenue generated so we have an important role to play in regard to the running of uh, both local government city county as well as as state uh, about $207 million is annual revenue generated by the university. That's employee, student, visitor spending uh, inside this community and region and state. And so the total, <clears throat> excuse me, economic impact is about uh, half a billion dollars, about $500 million, substantial. Uh, Murray State University is significant uh, to this region and state, and we're very proud of that. And um, and, and I thought you would find the, these uh, numbers and this information uh, instructive and helpful as, as we talk about the importance of the institution. So the next most important question I get is, 
how does enrollment look this year? Um, last year, the number one question was about Chick-fil-A, and I, I joked about that for a whole year, so I got a whole year out of that. Um, not as many people ask about Steak and Shake, but it's very popular and, and uh, with students and faculty and staff, and, and we're proud of, of that as well. But Chick-fil-A, everywhere I went, it didn't matter. The question was Chick-fil-A first <clears throat> and preliminary enrollment second. So a month in, we're still going through our preliminary enrollment, but here's really what it looks like. And so for the second year in a row, our first time students, uh, so first time freshmen, first time uh, transfers, first time graduate students, and that's, that's how our institution builds its enrollment base, are up for the second uh, straight year. As, as uh, many of you know, from 2015 to 2018, we had a significant decline in our enrollment. Uh, many other institutions did as well, but this institution is what matters and, and what matters to all of us and what matters to this region uh, was down significantly. And so we have given a, a, a laser-like focus in our enrollment management area. Dr. Robertson, our Vice President of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management is over this particular area. Uh, Sean Smee, <clears throat> excuse me, in this, uh, uh, is over undergraduate, uh, he's the director of recruiting over, over undergraduate uh, student recruiting. Uh, and he has a whole team of, of individuals and they've done a really good job. And we've really refocused this particular area. We've added uh, resources to this area. We've, we've uh, uh, really rolled up our sleeves and have worked hard in this particular area. Um, in 2018, I told you all this, I made a pledge and, and to, to do this, I continue to do it. Now, inside this pandemic period, I've not been able to do it, but I have visited numerous high schools, not only in Kentucky, but outside of Kentucky that, uh, you know, just because of our geographic location, Missouri and Tennessee and Illinois and Indiana are all vital, vitally important to this institution. So first time freshmen are up about 4.4%. The 18 counties, uh, which is our primary service region, uh, as designated by the Commonwealth, is up about 12%. So we give a lot of attention and focus to those 18 counties. Uh, our first-time freshmen for underrepresented minority students is up about 6%. They were 13% of the first-time freshman class. First-time <clears throat> transfers are up about 22%. which is significant. And uh, these are transfer students coming from other institutions, community colleges, junior colleges, uh, first time graduate students uh, are up more than 8.1%. I looked at the numbers yesterday. I did this uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago uh, and, and it's right at 10% uh, today. So we're very, very proud of that and we're very pleased and and the enrollment management folks i, I can't say this often enough I, I really really appreciate their leadership i appreciate them uh, assisting with this new focus and this mission and and making uh, all of this happen so what does the first time freshman class uh, look like valedictorians uh, so nine percent of our freshman class for valedictorians it's up from last year and last year was up from the previous year Retention, this is very, very important. The best way to build enrollment is to keep the students you have. And retention is vitally important. It's focused on by the Commonwealth, the Council on Post-Secondary Education, legislators, et cetera. And as a former legislator, I know how important that particular statistic is. Uh, last year was the was 79.3%, the highest of all the public comprehensive institutions in the Commonwealth. And this year it increased to 80.9. <clears throat> and the, the retention team that focuses on this particular area have done a, a masterful job in moving those numbers up again. These are hard numbers to move up. And they have done that and, and we appreciate uh, their hard work. Peggy Whaley uh, is a, a person head, that really heads up retention and, and the recapture of students and making sure that uh, these numbers need to be where they are. And retention, again, for everyone out there, that's really freshman year, sophomore year. That's where you have uh, the erosion or the melt. That's where students leave, uh, unfortunately. So that's first year to second year retention. Freshmen, uh, the freshman class hail from 28 states and 76 counties. 62% are Kentuckians. 
the total headcount of the institution, 45 countries, 48 states, 110 counties. So nearly every Kentucky county, nearly every state, and 45 countries. So we need your help. I'm not going to ask you for any money this morning. Some of you are, are extremely generous uh, each and every day and each and every week. And I pointed some of you out already. And, and I want to thank you again, anyone, alumni, friends, sponsors who, who make contributions of their time and their treasure to this institution. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, it makes all the difference. And in, in days of budget cuts, uh, and I'm going to touch on that in just a moment as well. In the days of budget cuts, this is vitally important. Private assistance is vitally important, and we appreciate uh, everyone's help in this particular area. However, where we need your help more immediately until we get past this period of pandemic, those of you who are apartment owners, restaurant owners, bar owners, et cetera, help us with our students, mask social distancing, making good choices, uh, keeping social gatherings controlled, uh, monitoring uh, apartment parties, etc. And all of these things are important. Yesterday, uh, for about the fifth time this semester, uh, our, our chief of police, Jeff Gentry, has been contacting the large apartment complex uh, owners and managers in regard to uh, the, the university, us, putting up signs at, at these locations of wearing a mask, you know, uh, using good judgment, making good decisions, and these type things. So we're doing that at the apartments off campus just to be uh, helpful to this broader community. And we're also talking to uh, everyone we can talk to in regard to these other topics. So help us uh, help the community, help us help Murray State University, help us help our students uh, as we go through these really simple, easy requests here that really in a civilized society are not asking a whole lot uh, when we say, you know, please wear a mask. Uh, again, the most important single thing we can do uh, to impact COVID-19. <clears throat> so, some not so positive news. So, I, I just want to give you an uh, update regarding some challenges ahead. These are items that we deal with uh, daily, and we're going to continue to deal with probably daily for the months to come. So, we're in fiscal year 2021. And so, last week we received a uh, notification uh, from the governor and the state budget director to be planning for a, and I want to stress this, a preliminary, planning for a, pre a preliminary reduction in our state appropriation uh, by 8%. So for, that's a, that's a lot of money. For Murray State University, it's about $3.5 million, okay? So we don't have $3.5 million laying around anywhere. Uh, nor does anyone else in this particular environment. So it, it makes uh, for hard structural decisions, hard decisions on behalf of the institution. Um, so we're working through that particular planning now. Performance funding, I won't go into the details of that, but that's the, the funding model that all public universities operate under in the Commonwealth. And it has not worked well for smaller institutions. We're obviously, we're not the smallest institution in the Commonwealth, public institution, but it is, performance funding is very driven on the size of the institution. If you graduate more students, you get more money. For us, for the last two years, we have received no money in regard to performance funding, and we're the highest performing uh, comprehensive institution in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Federal stimulus, <clears throat> That's in the news a great deal. It's been talked about uh, a lot since July. Uh, yesterday, the U.S. Senate talked about a federal stimulus bill, and they will be passing something, but we can't get both houses, both chambers, and, and uh, the federal government to uh, pass a federal stimulus bill that will help schools, K-12, through colleges and universities, and many others, businesses, and the list goes on and on. We need that help. 
And uh, so if any of you are talking to any of our, our federal legislators, uh, we, we need that help. We're very grateful for the money we received in the spring under the CARES Act. Murray State received uh, to offset operational costs associated with COVID-19 about $3.135 million, okay? Uh, which helped us offset a multiple of that number of related costs associated with, um, with the coronavirus, with, with this global pandemic. State budget issues are here for a while. We'll be continuing to deal with those. Uh, pensions, you, many of you have heard me talk about our KERS pension system uh, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, it has some tremendous structural problems. Uh, right now, our pension rate that we pay for KERS, not our teacher's retirement system, which our faculty members and administrators are in, so we're in, in two uh, pension systems, but the KERS pension system, we're paying about 49% contribution into that plan. Um, it was paused this year at 49% for the year we're in. Starting uh, July 1, that rate could go to 90 plus percent based on uh, the actuarial analysis and based on information that's already been sent to us. So we're, we're working on that. Enrollment I've talked about, 71% uh, of our budget today is enrollment driven, meaning uh, tuition and fees from students. Uh, 25 years ago, that number was about 30%. And 71% is where it is today. That number is not going to get any smaller in the, in the months and years to come. It's probably only going to get larger. Uh, but I wanted to point that out, that 71% of our budget is, is reliant on enrollment. The next legislative session uh, starts January of 2021 for the one of the first times in our, our state's recent history, um, the last legislature passed a one year budget only because of the global pandemic. So we'll be going back into session in January to pass the second year of the budget, which will start July 1. So we passed a one year budget only. Uh, the, the first time that's happened in, in probably since World War II. Uh, I haven't gone back and checked that, but I know in recent history, I, I served there for several years and, and uh, know the history fairly well. That hasn't happened very often. So we're, we're gonna have to work very hard in regard to the next legislative session and trying to impact in a positive way, funding for education at all levels, K through 12 through uh, public higher education. And Michelle, Jeanette, that was the last slide. And uh, I know we're, we're done at 10, so I've got nine minutes and, and I was sent some questions. You want me to touch on some of those questions very quickly? There we go, I'm unmuted. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I've sent a few questions. I remember the first one was talking about safety. Um, you hit on that on one of the slides where you were talking about the, the signs on campus, but maybe address how you are handling that with faculty and staff um, in terms of encouraging them to also practice the safety measures that you've put in place. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, let me answer it this way. So for the last several months, and I talked about the racial restart plan, or let, at least let me start here. Um, again, if you go to Murray State, dot edu slash racer restart you'll see everything that you can imagine and more in regard to a uh, global pandemic videos q a the entire plan that we put together with 200 faculty staff students administrators healthcare professionals so that's that's our guiding document that's our roadmap uh, it changes regularly as we get tweaks from the state and federal governments as we make our own tweaks internally uh, that document is updated regularly so uh, for our faculty staff students administrators and others who are, who are uh, in this particular meeting I would and I send this uh, information regularly you know look at that website often uh, and and there's a, again a lot of good information there and and really 95 percent of the questions that I get on a daily basis can be answered by going to um, that particular website masks are required on campus 
again, the most important single thing we can do, and that's faculty, staff, students, administrators, visitors to campus, et cetera, mask on campus. Also, for the last few months, and, and this is in regard to a safety measure, our facility management team has done a fantastic job led by uh, Vice President Jackie Dudley and, and Jason Youngblood and others have done an, an excellent job in regard to looking at every classroom, space, place, location on campus, and we redid capacity. And there's a lot of rooms, spaces, and places at Murray State University. So we, we went through and redid capacity <clears throat> to make sure that social distancing is, uh, can, can be complied with and, and we control the numbers in every particular room, any, any space or place or classroom. So those are some of the things that, that we've done. I mean, our, our job, obviously teaching and learning is what we're here for. And I never, I never thought that uh, we would be in this particular position that we're in today, but you know, right now, close second to that, to teaching and learning and maybe equal to that, and, and, and probably I could argue that it's even greater than that, is the health, safety, and well-being of our, our campus community, our students and faculty and staff in the broader community. Uh, and so far, so good. I mean, we're in week four. Uh, you can go to our website again. You can see cases. You can see information. You can see everything that we're posting and be able to ask questions from that. But uh, we've got important work to do in that particular area, and I, and I think uh, everyone's handled it very, very well. I'm really proud of our faculty and staff and our students. Um, everyone is complying extremely well with masks and doing the things we need to be doing on this campus. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of that piece. You know, in, in regards to hearing you say everyone's spread out in classrooms, a lot of our events are held on campus in the Murray Room. And I know you guys are using that space at this time to for some of that social distancing and extra classroom space as your professors and faculty are trying to do some virtual things as well. So we uh, appreciate y'all's measures in that. Yes, the, uh, the Murray Room, which probably everyone in this meeting has been in numerous times over the years, is a classroom. Uh, because it's a big space and, and uh, um, in, in, in the Lovett Auditorium, other big spaces, uh, rooms in John W. Carr Hall, uh, the old North Gym, the old South Gym, these are all set up for classrooms today in order to practice good distancing. One other question was about dorms. Um, you know, as you talk about a lot of the students are, are back for a second semester. Are you seeing more students maybe commuting, maybe living from home, or do you have a dorm at capacity? Um, so maybe to share what you're seeing in those term, in terms of those numbers. Our, our residential hall occupancy, uh, if you look at it on a pure numbers basis, would be down from last year. And one of the reasons is we have a lot more private rooms by design. Okay, so you know we made the decision to offer uh, our students the option of having more private rooms and they took us up on that many took us up on that so there's a lot of private rooms today so pure numbers are going to be down um, I don't have any metrics in regard to are there more commuters or not anecdotally uh, my gut would say yes that's the case um, but we're, we're, you know there's a lot of folks in on campus and a lot of folks in this community in, in that regard uh, so you know, a slight change, not not a great deal. Uh, a lot of private rooms and and those type of things. You know, and, and another thing that you made me think of with uh, residential halls. So right now we're planning for the spring, and we're looking at the academic calendar. And I, I want to thank uh, Provost Tim Todd, who's been excellent in, in his dealings and and uh, with the deans. And I want to thank the deans and the chairs everyone coming together to find the right solutions and the best solutions. So we're looking at the academic calendar, how to tighten the academic calendar and what the spring semester is going to look like. So we're, we're going through that as, as we speak as well. You know, I'm a Murray State graduate and I remember living on campus, having a roommate. And I, it's funny that you mentioned the private dorms. We always tell college students that that's the best practice for marriage is having a roommate. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
with each other and, and disagree. And so uh, it's interesting that they're choosing those private dorms, but good for them. <laughs> some are, not all, but uh, some are. <laughs> Well, that's all the questions that we had submitted to us. So do you have any final remarks or anything you'd like to say before we close out? No, again, I, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. It's, it, this is uh, uh, not the ideal or, or perfect situation in regard to uh, how we deliver this presentation. I'd rather be doing it in the Murray room and, and just eating a nice breakfast and, and I, I, love seeing everyone from that standpoint but i want to i want to thank this community i want to thank everyone's help in regard to uh, what they mean to this institution and and the support this community and this region and this state gives this university uh, I, i'm i'm very grateful to each and every one of them and as an alum and one of the few alums uh, that had the honor of being present in this place uh, I, I view and hold things uh, very dearly in that regard. There's a tremendous responsibility here. Again, it will pass, uh, and I look forward to it passing. Uh, Hood, I'm ready to wrap up. Uh, if Hood is still on here, I'm not, not sure. Uh, I'm ready for 2020 to pass, and uh, to get into 2021, I hate to wish my life away. So, Michelle, I would close with that for a better 2021. I already put my fall things out. I'm ready to get 2020 behind us as well. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jackson. We really appreciate your time. We work with Murray State, many departments, your alumni, town and gown, um, you know, recruiting office. We work with all the different departments and we just appreciate you and your staff and everyone for always being great partners in our community. Um, and I'm, I know I left a bunch of people out, so uh, we just want to thank you. And even in one of the comments, it said, thank you for your leadership. And that's very true. We are appreciative. Well, thank you. Thank Everyone's going through this together. And thank you. And, and Michelle, Jeanette, thank you all for what you do. The Chamber is very important in, uh, to this community and to Murray State. We appreciate both of you and what you do. Thank, thank you. you. Go racers. Go racers. Amen. Uh, and, and, and see racer one soon. Um, and I know Hood had to leave us, but I want to thank Hank for being here with us from AT&T. Um, the good thing about these virtual events, we all want to be in person, but we are recording this. So those who have reached out and said they couldn't be here today because they're running a business or maybe they're with clients, um, we have this recorded so we can push this out to our members to watch later as many people want to hear, always want to hear an update from Murray State. Because um, like you shared, it's such a large um, economic impact in our community, um, not only with, you know, money pumping into our community, but jobs. And so we really appreciate um, Murray State. And I'm, I'm full of Murray State pride as a graduate. So uh, appreciate you all. Hank, do you have anything you want to say before we go? Uh, no, thanks. It was a pleasure to be part of things today. Dr. Jackson, very informative. And uh, no question, Murray State is a pivotal, pivotal institution in this Commonwealth. Thank you for all you do. And we look forward to the rest of the sessions, Michelle. All right. Thank you, at &T. Thank you, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.